Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild Review, my written and video view series where I take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video will be reviewing the one-shot adventure, The Feather of Akaaya, designed by Leonardo Benucci for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. This review has been sponsored by the publisher, and a review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider using my affiliate links for your online shopping, and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. So let's get the uh, let's address the elephant in the room, and that is, of course, our clawed-headed friend here, which is an obvious representation to one of the more, I think still one of the more infamous uh, horror movie villains. I admit I am not the biggest horror movie aficionado, but I'm pretty sure... Even younglings uh, are at least tangentially aware of Freddy Krueger and those in the Nightmare on Elm Street series that spawned, gosh, I don't know, six, seven, eight movies throughout the 80s and 90s. Um, this adventure is not trying to do that. And I've mentioned before, I am actually a fan of when adventures do try and do that, where they take a a pop culture story, usually like a movie or, you know, something everybody's aware of, you know, we see this a lot with like fairy tale, like Grimm's fairy tales and Greek mythology and those things. Those, those always get translated to D and D adventures for pretty satisfying results. I think Disney movies, you know, obviously are just a lot of fairy tales and stuff. We don't see that for a lot of like just modern day. Like I, again, I would love to see like, you know, Jurassic park and King Kong and all these things like translated into D and D adventures because everybody has that shared experience and can have fun just exploring that space. This does not try to do that. Instead, this is actually a, from what I can tell, an original story that just happens to base its villain technically off of Freddy Krueger. The villain's name is um, Phobator, I, I believe, which is probably a play on like dreams or fears or something. Um, and it's a one shot where for level five players. That brings them to the dreamscape, which is the obviously the Freddy Krueger angle. And this villain has been imprisoned there, and the players don't know it, but they have been sent by a you know kind of generic quest giving NPC to uh, retrieve this feather, uh, this legendary magic item. And unfortunately for the players and for I guess the world, this feather is actually what's keeping uh, this villain imprisoned, and he is in this really cool like vertical prison in the middle of this raging storm in the dream world. It's a really interesting, neat setting for a one-shot adventure, and it helps uh, make this one-shot extremely memorable and unique, which I am ultimately a, a, a pretty big fan of. Um, let's skip ahead to the uh, actual map of it. So we get original artwork and an original map design on the positive side, I love that we get the cutaway map and the actual every single map chamber is dictated like this. That's awesome. Uh, not so much the actual map style, though, which is the, you know, that kind of... It, this is not a Dyson Logos map. The actual designer, I believe, did all the uh, cartography, but it's a style that I'm personally not a big fan of. It's just kind of that bare bones black and white style that's not really designed to actually play on. It's just designed for... Uh, DM to reference basically, but this helps a lot with me visualizing what this uh, dungeon looks like, which is a giant. Uh, this is a hexagon. Two, four, six, eight. No, it's an octagon. Duh. There's eight. Um, a giant octagonal shaped tower, three thousand feet into the middle of this just surging ocean of dark, you know, clouds overhead and everything, and you start off on the top of it. And you're, the, the actual transportation is kind of a little bit wonky because you're supposed to be talking to the quest-giving wizard. He's, he gives you a bunch of tea. You're supposed to drink the tea, which don't ever rely on your players to drink or eat anything you're going to give them. Players are usually a suspicious bunch, as they should be. Uh, and then he tells them, like, oh, well, and the players are like, well, where, where are we going? And they're like, oh, you've already, you know, you'll be there in a second. And, of course, they pass out and you wake up in the... Uh, actual dream world and you begin at the very uh, top of this really cool vertical dungeon design uh, there's an event that takes place when you're on the top where a if you light up a any kind of light source this giant crow which reminds me of the deep crow from penny arcade flies down snatches up the player puts them in a nest wherever they are and attempts to feed them to the a uh, little baby bird that's about to hatch out of there that kind of classic sequence but and this is indicative of what this adventure does is 
that could be just written like a normal combat encounter. You could just say, hey, if there's a light source flips on, a gargantuan crow appears, and then roll for initiative and have a fight. And then if a, if a crow manages to pick somebody up, they take them to you know the nest, and then that kind of creates another scenario. But in this case, this entire, that event is literally these two pages you can see from Terror from Above, including this page here. That whole crow thing I just described takes up two full pages because a large part of what the player can do is actually like try to talk to the crow or look around for loot or get some information and roll all the, it's, it's almost like a mini skill challenge. And that's kind of what the designer does for a lot of the confrontations here is instead of it being just a normal combat encounter, there's other things going on. There's like puzzle elements or there's role playing elements or something there. I think there was only one situation, uh, which is a, a basilisk in one of the chambers that is basically just a straight up fight. And even then it's, it's entirely optional. The players don't even have to enter this room uh, the information they presumably could need, although I don't think they necessarily need it, but they could have is actually on the right outside of the door. So that's a really cool aspect of this adventure. And you're supposed to play this adventure uh, as a one shot and you are supposed to time the players like they are in a mission, which is to go to this dreamscape and they only have so long before like the the, you know, in, it's almost like Inception, I guess, where you kind of go in there and you've got this long before you have to back out of it. Um, or you're lost in the dream world or whatever. In this case, it's whatever long your you know time frame is for the one shot. So three hours or four hours or something. The designer says four hours should be good enough. Three hours usually works pretty well if you keep things moving. And two hours is probably not going to be long enough to get through all of the things, even though combat is for the most part optional. But another cool thing the adventure does is these diabolical options, which are these red sidebars. And there are a couple of these throughout. I think there's over half a dozen throughout this adventure. That is basically the designer modding their own adventure by providing different things you can do, either uh, adding a enemy for the players to fight. Like there's one situation where the players could leave a room and just a rock is there that's just kind of in the area <laughs> that could attack the players. That's a diabolical option. Or you could do things like the environment becomes more hazardous. Um, you know, one of them is just like, hey, don't forget about the you know, the crow that's going to come down at them during a certain moment because they're jacking with an item that's going to give off some light and the crow's attracted to some light. You know, it's just a cool way of adding some more um, options for DMs to use that are all tuned to making things a little more challenging and a little more uh, tense. So when you start off here, you've dealt with the crow. There's a there's a kind of scaled down stone golem in the middle of the chamber uh, and, and on the top of the plateau which is a, uh, there's a dream deity called Danica, which built this prison to house her arch enemy, which is um, Fobadar, which is the Freddy Krueger-like villain. Uh, she is no longer, um, I guess she's like sleeping somewhere, just no longer active, I guess, um, just kind of in an extended vacation <laughs> retirement. Because, uh, I mean, you know, the enemy's in prison, you're going to do your job. Uh, but the players can find a statue and there's a passphrase that they need to tell the statue, but they don't know the passphrase. They'll have to, there are, I think, two different, or maybe even three different areas where they can actually find the passphrase if they go back up and go near the golem. And there's a cool bit where the golem is on a, uh, it'll basically say a greeting and expect the players to respond. And if they don't, that could be a combat encounter, but the players could just back off. And then the, the it you know, it, it doesn't automatically screw the players over, in other words, for just trying to come up there and see what's what. Um, if they actually flee the fight, then the golem will just kind of go back to the inert mode. And then maybe later when the players discover the passphrase and they can properly, which hopefully is what happens. So a lot of situations like that where the designer never really wants to screw the players over with necessarily a straight up combat and fight. Uh, and there's a, there's a really cool device where because it's a prison and the person who built the prison wants to be able to check in on the prisoners. There's a neat magic item next to that golem that players can use to actually like basically look at all the, like they turn it to different uh, chambers and they can look inside each chamber and get a really cool like preview to the entire adventure, which is a neat idea. Like usually that would be spoilery, but I think it, it's fitting in with the theme of, you know, hey, this is an, an active prison where the warden would be able to check in on things and give you just a cool view of like all the different things here. Yes, there are empty ones. In fact, three of the eight chambers, I believe, are just straight up empty, which is a little disappointing. Um, but the other five all have things going on in there that are pretty interesting. And, you know, this is a one shot. You need to be able to keep things moving. You don't want to necessarily be a big slog. And as you can see with the top, these all these little circles are, are ladders. 
So the players are encouraged to actually do this completely non-linearly. Like there's no reason for them to go to one, two, three, four, for example. The only one they can't do right off the bat, at least, is chamber eight because there's no ladder down there, which I don't even think there's enough. Chamber eight is obviously where the boss resides. Um, there are several doors <laughs> that act as like, hey, make sure you've been to this room. Although it's really all you can find all the answers, I believe, in chamber uh, seven. So and I'm not quite sure how you get to chamber eight because there's no ladder there. But the, the point is you're supposed to be going up and down these ladders. And one of the diabolical options is you can make those ladders like incur like exhaustion or, you know, make the players have saves. Otherwise, you can just kind of hand wave that and let them go up and down this area. But it, it's written in such a way where it's just it's really cool and evocative and, and full of just neat, like environmental storytelling with this surging ocean around and these different events players can see about like there's this giant figure in the distance like trudging through the water or giant form swimming through it's just it's supposed to be this really alien cool landscape and it's really really neat and that's something that you don't see a lot in a one shot because it's a one shot you don't know how much you can actually play with that and still keep things going you know in your limited time frame so i was i was very impressed with that um all right so a quick breakdown of chambers chamber one is and like i said you could do these in any order except i believe you can't you can't get down to chapter eight very quickly and chapter eight has doors that are uh you'll have to have the right pass phrases to not be basically obliterated chapter one is empty chapter two holds an alip which is a creature from morden kind tomb of foes that the designer has apparently fallen in love with because this thing does a really cool thing with alips which are undead creatures kind of like wraith type creatures that have gone mad but like its whole backstory like correctly builds into this character which is a former lover of the uh goddess who built this place and uh, she kind of disposed of her when she became, you know, infatuated with somebody else. And so this poor uh, woman was turned into a Alep, uh, which is a weird name for an undead creature. It doesn't sound very, I don't know, sounds like a Smurf type creature rather than this horrifying Wraith creature. But the neat thing is, you know, again, and it's uh, like chains and stuff. Like it's all very creepy and things when you like open the door, appear in there and the babbling. And it's written in such a cool way where like the words are all, you know, taken together uh, to where you can't like hardly understand what she's trying to say. But it's written like a role-playing or a social encounter, which I think is really, really fun. And obviously how I'd want to do it, you could have your, you know, your players can fight her if you want, but they could talk to her. She's got some information. She's going to want to possess somebody, you know, as a kind of a bargain. You can make a deal with her. And if you do that, it you can get information about the area and like the backstory. But on the negative side you incur some penalties whenever you like short rest you don't get to fully heal and you have to roll i believe con saves or intelligence checks to avoid getting exhaustion because of your you've got the madness like you have to write all your secrets down and do all these which i looked up the the alep creature in mordenkainen's to familiarize myself and that's all exactly in telling with that creature like you can tell the designer like really enjoyed reading about that creature and using it to its full extent so if your players haven't encountered an alep yet i think that's a really cool uh use of that care of that creature Chapter three holds a basilisk, or chamber three holds a basilisk, which is probably the only really standard fight in here. But again, it's entirely optional. Again, it's like chained up. Um, there's a woman outside who's been petrified who actually has a note that has the other end of the passphrase. So your players could get that information just by uh, getting that. And then the one big trap there is that the door is actually transparent. If you touch it, it, it makes the door transparent. So the basilisk can still try to petrify people without actually having to go through the motion of fighting it, which is interesting. Uh, chamber four is empty and yeah, it does mention why are there empty chambers? Well, it makes sense to be empty chambers. Well, th yes, that does make sense. Um, there are enough content here where I'm okay with it and it is a one shot. So you're going to run out of time if you try to fill all this stuff up. Although I still think there could have been some environment. I would have liked to see a bit more environmental storytelling, like what did hold these chambers? You know, I think some of them could have been empty with things in there. Uh, which I think actually chapter one, uh, chamber one does do that. There's a, there were, or well, chamber one has, uh, uh, chains and collars and then there's a key that can open the the creature that's in chapter two um chapter five has so the villain has been imprisoned and his weapon which is of course freddy krueger's classic um knife hand claw glove thing <laughs> with a bunch of like knives they've done there um you can find that which has chapter five is the one which if you look at the map it's not in uh order you can see here chapter three is like at the top chapter five is the bottom because again it's a dreamscape world nothing makes sense um, and that one has actually been, it's like on the water, basically only like, I don't know, 20 or 30 feet up or something. And, um, uh, water creatures have actually infiltrated this chamber. Like it's filled with water. There's a giant octopus that can come out little sea spawns and stuff. So there's a whole, that one is probably a more traditional combat encounter, but you could stealth your way in there if you wanted to. 
Uh, chapter six, I believe, is empty. Chapter seven has um, a really cool situation where there's a, a bunch of uh, a fellow uh, dream. Uh, I guess it's a genie. I don't know if it was a it's Gaia is a uh of servants venerator comes from the sect of the hunters yeah so she's got some followers i don't know if she was a deity or just a person that became a genie or whatever but she's there's a bunch of uh, her followers were all imprisoned in chamber seven because she tried to get a better reward from danica and danica said nah and literally just chained them all up and all the followers all 177 of them died of starvation and a horrific just being left without you know anything and the alternate is zombies are all chained up and they can't reach the lamp, which holds their genie uh, boss, basically. That's Gaia. And uh, it creates this uh, environmental hazard as the players need to read the inscriptions on the walls, but there's just hordes of zombies all around these walls. It's a little bit too easy because if the players open the lamp, the wispy remains of the genie come out. She says like her little bit about, oh, I made a mistake. And all the zombies are like mollified after that, and the players can then just read the instruction. That seemed a little bit too easy to me. I would have kept, I would have, I like the actual diabolical option here that says uh, the zombies become furious and several of them like break tra- chains and maybe turn into a little bit more of a combat encounter versus the players don't jack with the lamp at all. Then it turns into like an environmental hazard where they're having to avoid, you know, it's a walking dead situation. There's just hordes of zombies. You don't really want to fight them all. So it becomes more of a just having to avoid them, but still having to read, you know, the things on the walls that you can't get to. So I think that creates a really cool situation. And it's written in a riddle. And the players have to deduce um, what this riddle means and then apply that to the doors they come across in Chamber 8. So I think that solves the uh, the exploration pillar very, very nicely by creating these kind of riddle puzzles that they have to then apply here. There's a black pudding fight. Um, one of the riddles is to... There's a thing where the players get a glove uh, from the original quest giver, and the glove has two different sides. It's a like inside out, a red side and a blue side. And that matters a lot because sometimes if they touch something with a red side, it's good. And other times it's bad. And that determines if they take like a, a lot of damage or whatever. There's a part where it's like, you know, you need to put the key in a certain thing. And it's very Tomb of Annihilation-y where there's a certain uh, part where you have to, you know, like find the hidden, it's like the, there's a mouth. And of course the mouth has the keyhole in it. If you put it, the key in there, bad things happen. You have to realize that the riddle told you, okay, it's actually behind the eye and you have to lift the eyelid. All that I think works out very, very well. There's a really cool puzzle riddle thing earlier with the Alep that I glossed over where she, in part of her babbling madness, she says basically like the main, the feather is in, in when infinity stands up. And that of course is a reference to chamber eight because it looks like an infinity symbol with a number eight. I think that was a really cool, that, that's, that's the kind of perfect, riddle that's not like too clever or up its own ass but is just smart enough and your players can figure out fairly quickly and also feel smart in figuring that out that's the perfect kind of puzzle design i like for DD. and that's a hard thing to do is you want to make it so your players have to work a little bit but you never want them to reach that like oh we're stumped stamp you know like if you're playing a puzzle on an adventure game or something and you're you're working through the motions and all of a sudden you just get stumped and you feel the minutes pass and you're just like i'm i don't know what i'm doing that's the part you want to avoid in DD. So it's a very tricky razor's edge you got to walk when it comes to the puzzles. And I think this one does uh, does do puddle, puzzles uh, pretty well and satisfying. Now we're going to get to the one area that I thought was disappointing in this adventure. And unfortunately, that's the finale. Um, so this whole time, and it's a really cool, immersive, memorable dungeon crawl. You know, it's a one shot. So you're not spending too much time here. You're going through the chambers. You get to the final boss, which is... Um, Obadar and I think I pronounce it different each time. Um, he has not been present this whole time, which is a bummer because I think one of the reasons that uh, you know Freddy Krueger is so beloved is because he's very talkative and always cracking jokes and just you know a, a, a charismatic presence in those movies. And Fobador is not. He has been waiting this whole time. He can spy on the players. Uh, his chamber has, you know, deteriorated enough where he can, he's aware of their presence and he sets up, he's a master of illusions. Of course, that's how you translate Freddy Krueger into a D&D character. And he sets up this scenario, which seems pretty interesting, where he fabricates, there's a couple things that are real in the room, like the feather on the reliquary uh, and these bra- uh, braziers that are lit with fire um, and the and the chain he's got chaining him up to the wall. And then he creates a bunch of illusions to make it so there's like like a demon on a slab. There's this huge alchemical, alchemical laboratory. The chain is actually a, a long flowing scarf. 
And he has made himself look like this, uh, like, I thought he made himself look like Danica, but I guess he's supposed to be some kind of, like, dryad, lich, witch thing. Um, so, the problem here, that's okay, even though we've never seen him before or heard from him, which is a bummer. But then you're supposed to run it where it assumes, I guess, the players don't see through any of the illusions, which these are 5th level players... So by now you've got a lot of tools, you've got third level spells, you've got things you can use to spell magic and counter spells and all those. As well as you would have players that could just... And it does mention the fact that players can figure out, you know, what is real and what isn't real just by touching things and whatnot. The weird thing is, the way you're supposed to run it, it says... Uh, Fobador acts, always acts after the PCs, but you pretend to roll initiative. And the spells and attacks always miss. Otherwise the PCs could find out they're just illusions. Well... Yeah, you can't do that on a VTT. Like, obviously, I play on Roll20. Everything is shown in public view, so you can't really bullshit players that way. So I, I'm i not sure how you could run this to make it satisfying um, other than you run it straight and then immediately realize they're not actually taking damage, which is a pretty big giveaway. The problem is that your goose is cooked pretty early. It, it's very hard to deceive players, even with one minor thing. You know, and I mentioned at the very beginning, like getting them to drink the tea and stuff. Like, even that is is a bridge pretty far in this case you're expecting me to run an entire combat encounter that's just phony that that expects the players to buy into it in a way that i doubt they would although it sounds like this adventure was play tested quite a bit um i'd be curious to see how the things actually went for this final uh finale um i just don't see it working very well it, it seems very awkward the point of it isn't obviously for Fobador to fight the players. He can't. He's he's chained up. He's trying to make it so that he's looks like an evil threatening thing and that the players by by stealing the feather it would be a good thing, which I get that. That motivation works. I just don't think that the illusion stuff um is as a combat encounter works. I think it could have been he could have used his illusion magic in a different way, like, oh, he's he's somebody who is a good person who's trapped and by and by grabbing the feather, they will free him, you know, and, and 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 that's, you know, that could be a better way of doing illusion rather than just running a straight up combat fight, in other words. Um, don't fall into that trap where you need a boss battle, in other words. And, and the designer did such a good job so far of not running like straight up combat encounters for a lot of these situations. It's disappointing that this one ends up uh, being one and ends up being a really dissatisfying one, I think, in the end. Um, and the actual goal, of course, is to grab the feather. And then once that happens, and, and there is no stat block for Fobiter, by the way, because it even says, like, he's a he's a big-time, like, dreamscape deity. Like, you don't want to know what he can do, which that's always kind of a cop-out, but okay. And then when the players remove the feather, he just basically says, hey, thanks, you freed me, and then kind of disappears, and the players can get the fuck out of there. Or they can leave the feather and just leave anyway and just go back to the quest giver and say, hey, by the way, that feather you wanted is imprisoning this really bad guy. We're just going to leave him there. That's kind of narratively dissatisfying but ultimately the right choice for the players to make which is weird like they basically get all the way there they decide not to take the thing because it is imprisoning the this huge dangerous villain and they just kind of return empty-handed and then th thankfully the uh the quest giver does reward them a little bit if they if they leave it behind but still it, it's just, it's an odd turn of events in other words um and then if even if the player is free uh Fobador, it just you know, it's out of the context of this one shot. He's like, I can now wreak havoc and everything. Now, there is a cool bit at the end, which I really like that the designer does this, which is an epilogue um, that includes half a dozen optional dream sequences that players can experience. And this is where the designer fully lets loose with a lot of uh, direct ties to like Nightmare on Elm Street scenes, which... Uh, again, I've, I don't think I've ever actually seen a full one of those movies, but I'm a big fan of the Dead Meat uh, YouTube channel, which is how I watch watch a lot of the horror movies, and so I've seen all these sequences, and uh, it it does a really cool job of recreating some with you know him chasing people and clawing them, and you wake up and you've got the claw marks you know on your neck or something, and that's all really cool if you free him. And what's neat is a lot of these um, epilogues say, "Hey, did you free him? Did you take his clawed hand?" Did you keep the clawed hand but not free him? Did you take the? Did you not? Did you not take the feather? You know, there's all these different uh, situation epilogues that can occur as a cool like final thing. That part's really neat. I'm still disappointed in the actual climax itself, but the epilogue sequence is pretty cool. And there was a lot of work put into this. And plus, you know, this is a one shot adventure that's over 40 pages long. Like that's huge for something that should only take you know three or four hours. That's bigger than a lot of, like, mini adventures I've reviewed. There's just so much content and detail in here, despite some of the chambers being empty. 
that the designer painstakingly goes through. And I mean, as I mentioned, that huge gargantuan crow encounter was like two full pages because it's not just a combat encounter. It could be a skill challenge. It could be a role playing thing. There's a chance to explore around and find some loot. It just do, does a really great job with with creating multiple ways for the players to interact with the scenario, as well as creating a really immersive situation that you can do um, a lot with. I appreciate that both the feather and the claws, which was that thing you could find in Chamber 5, I believe, uh, the, the villain's claws, are both actual magic items that are very powerful and have, um, in the claws case, a very big curse where it basically turns you into Freddy Krueger, which is kind of a kind of a bummer. Um, a few stat blocks. I think the Gargantuan Crow is just kind of a scaled down rock and Danica's Guardian is a scaled down stone golem, but that's fine. And then some neat, interesting, uh, not interesting, original artwork uh, that actually depicts uh, events and things that are happening in the adventure, which is also very, very cool. All right, let's go over my pros and cons for the Feather of Aka. I, uh, pros, original artwork, including maps of the prison and its chambers. Uh, it's it's well designed. It looks cool. And I always appreciate, although you'll see on my cons, I'm not a fan of the actual uh, you know, black and white bare bones map design. But this map in particular is what really put it on the pro list for me because it has that nice side view where you can see uh, where all the chambers are located and helps me visualize, okay, what do you mean when you have an, a hex, a 3,000 foot hexagonal tower, 120 foot aside with ladders reaching down? What does that even look like? And this nicely does a good job of portraying that for me. Uh, pro, nearly every confrontation can be solved without combat, which is very, very cool. And multiple uh, almost just events that have hostile creatures like the Alep or the Crow or those that room full of zombies. All of those things can be solved through other means rather than just straight combat, which is always very cool. Pro, diabolical options for increasing difficulty and tension. There are uh, over half a dozen of these, I believe, that give, uh, again, a good way for the designer to mod their own uh, adventure by situation or by room is saying, hey, here's how you can create a a thing that makes this thing more challenging or, you know, if your players are just coasting through, if you want to, you know, spice it up a bit and it helps it having that separate uh, sidebar too. It makes, you know, draws the eye and says, okay, here's how we do this. And pro have as an optional epilogue dream sequences. I really like those things at the end that helps really pull together the actual like Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street, nightmare stuff and gives you a nice little taste of kind of what the consequences of what you've done, even just in the context of a one shot, I think is pretty fun. Cons. The final boss fight is disappointingly simple and gimmicky. I don't like that the illusion magic is used to try to simulate a a combat encounter. I don't think that works for me, at least as just looking at it. Maybe, and, I, and as specifically as somebody who plays on a virtual tabletop like Rule Twenty, uh, I, that would not work. Like you can't just fake a combat sequence and have it be like, oh, you take this much. I mean, I guess you'd have to go through it and say you take this much damage, and then somehow at the end of the combat you'd be like, oh, you actually didn't feel anything. Yeah, it's it just doesn't work. It's very awkward to try to to try to make it work. Uh, and the other con is that the the actual map style doesn't have any detail or isn't good enough to where I would actually also use it on a virtual tabletop. It is useful for a DM to see the visual representation of the dungeon, but not it's not good enough that we could actually play on it. Final verdict with its unique vertical dungeon design and detailed encounters, the Feather of Akaaya provides an immersive and memorable one-shot adventure. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson, and you can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.